Welcome to uh, episode 13. Today we're joined by two amazing doctors. We've got Dr. Ian Lake will be joining us first uh, to talk about diabetes and what diet uh, we should be eating to protect ourselves against diabetes, maybe even put it in remission if we're uh, type 2. Uh, then we've got the incredible uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick coming up later on to talk about uh, heart disease, cholesterol. He, he's written three amazing books. Uh, the Cholesterol Con is a real must read for anybody that's on statins. Uh, and his other book, uh, Doctoring Data, is probably the best book I've ever, ever read. Now, uh, if you're new to the show, uh, welcome. Uh, my name's Steve Bennett. I'm your host. And together with brilliant doctors, nutritionalists and chefs, uh, during the lockdown period, we're going to try and inspire you to try new things in the kitchen. Uh, and also really to say, look, after social distancing, after washing our hands, the next best thing we can do is eat real foods, get our diet right, and we want to inspire you uh, with new things to be cooking. But of course, the program's called The Food Bank Show for a very good reason, and that is that we're trying to support food banks across the UK. We've partnered up with the Trussell Trust, who run around 1,200 food banks, and they desperately, desperately need our help at the moment, more than ever during this sort of crisis that we're in, more people need our support, our help at the food banks. Uh, and, 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 and basically less and less donations are going in at the moment because people are quite rightly rushing in and out of the supermarkets. They really, really need our help. And in fact, what I'll do this morning, because I haven't done it for a few days, let's take you and show you a small film about the Trussell Trust. Last year, food banks in the Trussell Trust's network distributed almost 1.6 million three-day emergency food supplies to people in crisis. That's a 19% increase from the previous year and 73% more than what was distributed five years ago. The main reasons for people needing emergency food are benefits not covering the cost of living or delays or changes to benefits being paid. People are being pushed into poverty because there isn't enough money coming in to cover the costs of essentials. It's not right that anyone is forced to turn to a food bank as a result. We all have a responsibility to play a part in ending hunger and poverty in the UK. Together, we can make it happen. This can change. So they really, really need our help as much as we possibly can. Now, one of the things we ask you is, what did you cook for the first time yesterday? Uh, well, we did a couple of things for the first time uh, yesterday. Uh, first things, my wife found where the kitchen was. Um, uh, that's a little <laughs> bit of a joke. Uh, she normally hides my Christmas presents in the oven. That's also another joke. But um, no, she did. She cooked this amazing meal yesterday. She cooked us a salmon bake, and, and that's... Uh, uh, Sarah's salmon bake, which was absolutely fantastic. And then we also did something for the first time. We camped in the garden last night. That's why I got a bit of a backache this morning. And uh, little Louis, our uh, four and a half year old, first time he's ever been camping. So that was uh, quite an amazing uh, event yesterday, uh, post show, of course. Uh, and then what were you cooking for the first time uh, yesterday? We'd love to know uh, because we believe during lockdown, while the McDonald's, the Greg's, the Subway's, the KFC, the Burger King's are all closed down, then we've got to change our eating habits anyway. So why not change them for the good? Because we know if we eat real food, that's the best defense we can have against COVID, against the flu, in fact, against many, many, many things. We need to bolster our immune system. Uh, and when you cook something new, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, Easter Sunday, send us a photograph to Primal Living on Facebook. And uh, we've got a competition going at the end of lockdown. We're going to pick a winner, our favorite looking recipe that you've come up with. We'll probably even put it in the next cookbook that we're doing with your permission. Uh, and also we're going to give a thousand pounds worth of free jewellery to one lucky winner. Um, right. One of the things just quickly before we go and, and speak to, to Dr. Ian Lake, uh, every day we've been saying, guess the amount of sugar in X, Y and Z. And yesterday we asked you, how much does a pack of chips uh, in, not the big chips from the fish and chip shops, uh, but from the KFCs, from the McDonald's. What does that turn into, into sugar inside the body? Now, before I tell you this, it's the last one of these slides. And the reason for that was we've kind of highlighted all the things where there's lots of hidden sugar. We've got one more to do later. It's the easy one to pick on. It's the can of Coke. 
I left that one till last. So far, we've looked at how much potatoes turn into sugar, the effect on the blood glucose levels. We looked at pasta, we've looked, we haven't done pasta actually, uh, we've looked at rice, we've looked at several other things. And what we're going to do in coming days, we're going to show you Dr. David Unwin slide. He's got a whole host of things that turn into sugar, but for now, the answer to how much a tiny little portion of chips turns into sugar inside your body is around almost six spoons full, six cubes of sugar within the body, those little chips, and then add that to the bun, and we know the bun turns into a lot, and all of a sudden you've got loads and loads and loads of sugar racing around inside your bloodstream. Um, and today, uh, the other thing we do is we give you a, because that's the one competition, the other one is try and write down how many foods that we talk about, because that's the negative, isn't it? We're giving you the negative of what turns into sugar, got to cut those down. But then we're trying to give you a food fact to inspire you with things to change out uh, in the food that you're eating. So every day we give you a food fact. Just write down the name of the food fact. So today is spinach. And then get a whole list. And when you've got that whole list, again, we're going to have a competition when we come out of this food bunker, when we come out of lockdown period. So spinach is an amazing, amazing, amazing food. It is full of antioxidants. It is full of minerals, it is full of vitamins, and technically speaking, clever people, uh, I think it is in Sweden, yes it is, just look at the chart there, in Sweden have discovered that because it is, has nitrates trapped within it, that's what gives us muscles, so Popeye was right after all, that spinach can help give us muscles. That's today's uh, food fact. Right, without further ado, to uh, today's discussion is around diabetes and around heart, and preventing CVD. Um, let's have our very first guest on, which is Dr. Ian Lake, a specialist uh, in diabetes. Good morning, Ian, how are you doing? Morning, very well, thank you. Yeah, it's a good series so far. I've been watching quite a few of them and really enjoying it. Oh, learning you. a lot. Yeah, aren't we all? Isn't it fascinating? Yeah. I mean, you, you never mm. stop learning. Uh, we, we had um, uh, Patrick Holford on, we learned from him, and then we learned a lot about mindfulness yesterday, which was, which yeah. was, which was fantastic. So um, today, diabetes and diet. Tell us about uh, about diabetes and diet. And um, oh, we seem to have lost you just there. Right, while we get uh, you back, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Ian Lake more formally then, uh, while we get his video feed back. Uh, so Ian is a type one diabetic. And let me just quickly explain the difference between a type one diabetic and a type two diabetic, which my father is. So type one is, we think, has been caused where something's gone with the, wrong with the immune system. And with a type one, the pancreas, which releases insulin to deal with the onslaught of sugar uh, and uh, carbohydrates. Um, and we only need insulin really for those two, small amount uh, for, for protein, but really it's all about the pancreas releases insulin because when we eat sugar or carbohydrates are turned into sugar, that in the bloodstream is poison. So uh, if it's not used for energy, insulin's released, it grabs the sugar, stores it away as body fat for future day, just in case you get stuck on a desert island or something. Or like when man was hibernating, not so much hibernating, but couldn't get food in the winter in the sort of hunter-gatherer days, all that lovely fruit would come in the, uh, the sort of autumn, we'd eat loads and loads and loads of fruit, and delivery, it would store it as body fat for us you know, to get through the winter. So type one is where the pancreas has stopped making any insulin at all. It's just stopped producing it. Uh, and that is type one. Type two diabetes uh, is where the cells that, that, that take the sugar and store it become kind of insulin resistant. The way I describe it, it's like being in a noisy office. The first few days you go, oh, how am I gonna cope with this? Then eventually you don't even notice the noise. You become resistant to the noise. And what happens with the type two diabetic is that because mainly uh, an overdose of sugar, carbohydrates, bread, pasta, rice, it grabs, the insulin grabs all of that, it shoves it into our fat stores, but eventually the fat stores go, look, I've had enough, I've had enough, I've had enough, uh, and therefore what we really want to be doing if we're type two is cutting down the need for insulin so the cells don't become so resistant. Sadly, a lot of medication doesn't do that. A lot of medication like what my dad's on is just providing more and more and more insulin because my dad injects himself every day, which in some senses 
is a complete nonsense because the cells are already insulin resistant. What's really needed, I believe, uh, is a change in diet. So that's the difference between type 1 and type 2. Have we got uh, Ian back? We still went uh, to get Ian back. Uh, it, it's technology for you. Uh, Pre-show this morning, we, everything was working fine. We had a lovely, lovely chat and a catch-up uh, with Ian. Um, so that's the difference between a type 1 and a type 2. Type 1, it, it's, it's nobody's fault. It's just completely, if you like, bad luck. We, we don't know exactly why the immune system breaks down with a type 1. There's lots and lots of theories, like too much antibiotics and things like that. But nobody for sure knows with the type 1, why a pancre the pancreas stops creating insulin. Uh, for every 100 people uh, that are diabetic, it's a very small percent that are type 1. What most people have is that insulin resistance and type 2 diabetics. Really, this is a new thing. This is, I'm not saying it's never happened in history, but this is really has just gone from very, very, very few people uh, 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 sort of 100 years ago to being an epidemic uh, across the UK. The good thing with type 2 is that for three or four decades, doctors were telling people it's irreversible, it's chronic, it's degenerative. But the truth of the matter is, that is not the case. We've now learned that you can reverse, let's not use the word reverse, and we'll learn later why not to use the word reverse, let's say put in remission type 2 diabetes. In fact, in the UK, over 70,000 people, and in fact, let me correct that, uh, Dr. David Unwin said the other day over 100,000 people have now put in remission their type 2 diabetes. How have they done that? They've changed the food they're eating. They've changed the need for so much insulin and therefore the cells become less insulin resistant because there's less insulin needed. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, you cut out all the sugars we know about. You don't drink the coca Cola. You also then cut right, right down. In fact, if you can completely get rid of sort of the processed carbohydrates, the highly refined carbohydrates. You cut down the bread, you cut down the pasta, you cut down the rice. If you can get rid of them completely, that's fantastic. So in our family, we never, never have boiled rice anymore. We have cauliflower rice. We make our own cauliflower rice and we can do all sorts with that. We can fry it out, we can add flavor, we can add garlic, we can add other stuff that just tastes amazing. We don't, well, let me retract, say never, we very rarely have pasta in the house. We use courgette, so we get spiralized uh, courgettes and we make pasta out of courgettes. Uh, even pizza bases, we still have the lovely pizza. The kids love pizza. In fact, we haven't said hello yet to you yet, children. How are you this morning? We're good. Who's in the house? Oh, Lily. Half the house. Half the house today. <laughs> Just two of the five children. Funny enough, the children that weren't camping in the garden last <laughs> night <laughs> on the show, all the kids that were camping in the garden, including me. And you know what, my wife, I don't know if I told you this, my wife camped with us last night. Well, we thought she did. But about half 11, she said, I'm just going to the house for a wee wee. She never came back. And the children and I woke up at about half six this morning. No wifey, she disappeared. Ah, maybe she found where the kitchen was. Um, right, so uh, how are we getting on? We got Ian back yet? We still can't find Ian. Can we maybe call Malcolm early then? Let's get uh, uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick on while we try and uh, recover the technology uh, to get Ian back. Let's, while we're doing that, also turn to uh, uh, YouTube to say hello, see if we've got any questions coming in this morning. And this morning we've got... Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us uh, from Primal Living. Uh, they said, don't forget, uh, just go and check out Just Giving. We've got some more donations come on this morning, which is fantastic. Thank you for your kind donations. Uh, MG uh, uh, from India says, I cooked chickpeas with zucchini, tomatoes, onion, and paneer. I think paneer is a cottage cheese uh, in India. Uh, and zucchini is what the Americans call courgette. So, uh, uh, yeah, brilliant. Uh, uh, Norma says, hi, I am type two. I really want to go for it this year, plus lose weight. Can you should suggest where I start? Norma, that is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question. Where do you start? You pick a day, first of all. You need a start day when you go, because maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, because it's Easter Sunday, maybe not Monday, but pick a day when you want to start. 
Go into your pantry and remove anything that is processed carbohydrates. If you've got pasta there, if you've got rice there, take it out. Go and give it to the food bank in the collection points in the local supermarket because they need any food at the moment and that's two of the foods they are requesting. And then you make a decision to start afresh. Um, you might, might start by downloading my book. It's uh, been dropped to £3.99. All the profits are going to the Trussell Trust from the book. So you simply go to Amazon, download the Kindle version or get hold of the print version. Next thing you do, you log on to a website called diabetes.co.uk. Make sure it's that one, diabetes.co.uk, not diabetes.uk. I personally have a problem with that one because at a conference recently they were sponsored by Schweppes. That's a no-no. Diabetes.co.uk, they're the ones that have helped over 70,000 people put their diabetes into remission. Um, so that's the advice I've got. Pick a day you want to start, clear out your cupboard, get some recipes. We've put all of our recipes from Primal Gourmet uh, in this difficult time, we put every single one of them for free. Uh, on primalliving.com. So go and look at the recipes. You just got to cut down all the processed carbs. Ian, how are you, my friend? We got you back. Back, yeah, glitch. <laughs> glitch, glitch, glitch. So I've, I've given a big introduction to you. I've tried to explain as best as I can difference between type 1, type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Um, talk to us about food and diabetes and what we all should be eating. Yeah, uh, I think we should more be concentrating on type 2 diabetes because that's probably what your program is mostly about. I mean, people at the end of uh, their type 1 sort of um, condition tend to get a bit of type 2 as a result of over-injecting insulin, but type 1 is slightly different with respect to diet, although I, I would argue it's essentially the same principle of eating real food. Um, I, I see type 2 diabetes as a spectrum, really. Um, what happens is that your body finds it difficult to handle glucose and it eventually spills out into the uh, urine and then you diagnose type 2 diabetes but way before that you've got other conditions uh, that we diagnose as, as almost separate diseases so we've got obesity uh, we've got pre-diabetes we've got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease we've got type 2 diabetes and they're all part of the same spectrum, but just reflect a different aspect of, of poor me metabolic health in your body. So some people would be more likely to get fatty liver, say, than probably type 2 diabetes, just because of the way their metabolism works. But it's all based on the same principle, that the body can't handle glucose very effectively. So whatever you eat, as far as, the, as, far as carbohydrates go, most of those will end up getting converted into glucose in your body. And no doubt you've talked about this throughout the week. Uh, it's only when you're of that vulnerable type of person where your body can't handle the glucose um, that you start to become diseased. So if you can't handle glucose just because you're of that makeup, and it does tend to run in families, doesn't it, um, mm -hmm. uh, type 2 diabetes, then your, your, your glucose has to be moved somewhere, and the body tends to use the, the glucose to store it as fat for later use, as we all know. Uh, but the problem is glucose is difficult to shift and therefore insulin levels go up. And, uh, and I think that is probably the root cause of the problem. So we've got this um, crazy situation at the moment where I think we focus on the wrong nutrient to target um, diabetes. Because the reason why we developed the diet heart hypothesis was that we felt that cholesterol initially and then fat and especially saturated fat was the cause of heart disease and we've, we've concentrated on that almost exclusively so if i mentioned the word cholesterol to you you'll think straight away of heart disease and of course cholesterol has multiple functions in the body and heart disease it's present at the site of, um, of uh, damaged coronary arteries but it may not be causing the problem and with type 2 diabetes, I think it, it's, it's sort of analogous. We've got raised sugar, but why is the sugar raised? But we do know it does cause the disease, because people with type 2 diabetes tend to have um, a much higher incidence of heart disease. So you have two to three times increase in heart disease if you've got type 2 diabetes, and that is worse 
the higher your average sugar levels in your blood. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is we shouldn't be too complacent about that because if you don't have diabetes and you have a normal uh, measure of long-term glucose in your blood, which is called HbA1c, Hb in the globin on red blood cells, A1 is one of the proteins in that, and C is a carbohydrate, and that measures your average sugar over the previous three months. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you're in the normal range, in the top fifth of that normal range, you're three quarters more likely to have a heart attack than if you're in the bottom fifth of that range, which suggests that sugar is probably uh, toxic. Um, and we certainly know that as people with diabetes progress and their sugar control isn't very good, uh, we do get diseases of the blood vessels, don't we? We get uh, small vessel disease eyes and kidneys and feet, and then we get large vessel disease, and that's coronary arteries and, and, and brain arteries, and we have strokes, don't we? So, so it's not a very nice disease overall, but, it, but I think we're starting to show now that it is becoming reversible. Mm. But we're not reversing it by lowering the sugar, okay? We say, oh, the sugar's high, let's bring the sugar down. So we've got, I don't know, a dozen drugs now, probably every week you've got a new drug, haven't you? And they all lower sugar. But in the, in the end, they're not dealing with the problem. We just, in my experience, pile on more and more and more medication. And only in the last five years, like Dr. David Unwin and, and, and others in the field, are we starting to realize that diabetes is a metabolic disease. So now we're starting to reduce the um, carbohydrates in the diet. And uh, that seems to be getting good results. Now, the interesting thing about this is um, there's no science behind 55% carbs in your diet as a recommendation. So we say, oh, you need your diet as a balanced, healthy diet, which is, of course, a marketing term. It's not, it's not a scientific term, balanced, <laughs> healthy, balanced diet. We all, we all want a healthy, balanced diet, don't we? It's, it's normal. Um, so the science behind 55% carbs come from the fact that we were scared stiff of fat because we assumed that this fat that was caused by heart disease or any fat was probably smoking in retrospect. So we said, oh, you've got to cut down on your fat, so therefore we're going to give you more sugar because that's cheap, easy to produce, and of course Kellogg's, we're rubbing the hands with glee and, and all companies. And, and you can see why that was. I mean, carbohydrates have a good long shelf life, and they do provide energy. And in hard times, they're the safe time of a lot of people. So we've ended up with this recommendation that 55% carbs should be the basis of our balanced diet, anything but. Because almost the day that there is rules and uh, recommendations are put in place, diabetes escalated. The whole of my clinical career, diabetes type 2 is a relatively rare condition. Uh, and now it takes up 8 to 10% of our workload, plus all the complications that have to be managed. So it's a difficult problem. The other so, thing. That, so let me, let me get this right. Before we, right. Before we introduced the Eat Well plate, which is now on my bedroom mirror. Uh, yeah. which I, I think has probably killed more people than all the world wars put together. Um, yeah. b before we had any government guidelines, diabetes was very rare. We now have these crazy guidelines which really support the Kellogg's, the big, big, big brands. And sure. It maybe, maybe came about for good intentions to start off with sure. because nobody really knew in the 60s what was causing heart disease. But now we know the fact that real natural fats aren't deadly, it's only the man-made oils that are deadly. We know that this is wrong, but for some reason we haven't yet changed those guidelines. So, and, and ever since we've had those guidelines, the average adult in the UK has put on two and a half stone, which is 17 kg, and diabetes has gone through the roof. So it's time to turn your back on what the government is saying in terms of food at the moment till we get that change, they have a whole different uh, a charity that was well, not a charity, it's a not-for-profit that I run called Health Daddy, and our primary thing is to get that abolished. I think so. I think, as you say, it's probably set up with the best intention. I mean, most people in, in most healthcare situations are, work with the best intention to try to do the best, but I think that's outdated. We've learned so much since then, and things just haven't caught up, and there are some people who sort of refuse, really, to, to, to see the obvious. And let me just get into... Ian, let me say something just quickly there. I, I was once taught that it's hard to change your opinion and look at the evidence when your salary depends on it. Yeah, I heard that one. It's <laughs> 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 probably quite true. Yeah. So um, I'm just thinking about the statements, and people send me these all the time, and I'm sure they're wind up. 
that they, people stand up, quite seriously look at the camera and say, sugar is the preferred fuel of the body. And you've heard that so many times from so many people. Sugar is the preferred fuel of the body. And that is, that is just not true. Mm. I think sugar is a useful fuel for the body. Uh, and you say, well, why, why is the sugar the preferred fuel? Well, the brain needs it. And you think, okay, that there are certain tissues of the brain and, and other tissues in the body that require glucose exclusively. The obvious one is the red blood cell. The red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have all of the normal cell architecture. Uh, so it relies on simple mechanisms of glucose to, to oxygenate the blood. Uh, and the structures in the brain uh, are important um, devourers of glucose and, and tissues that uh, such as the hippocampus and the cancer nigra, which uh, reflects the cause Alzheimer's disease or uh, Parkinson's if they're, if they're damaged, probably need glucose. So yes, your brain does need glucose, but some clever dick years and years ago worked out that the brain needs 130 grams of glucose in, in order to survive. So isn't it interesting that 130 grams is now the, the baseline for a low carb diet? Is the science very, very woody around it? Um, yep. But, but the body can also create glucose, can't it? So, um, you know, short, short, thing, I've got a couple of slides. If you just put slide number one up. Yeah, we'll do that for you. Through, I think it's very important. For, okay, so this is a, a cell of the body, an idealized, non-specialized cell. So I just want you to concentrate on three things here. There's the orange outer coat. There's the light blue thing called the cytoplasm, which is just the basically the fluid that everything else floats in. And then at the top and bottom of the screen, there are these orange structures with wavy lines in them, and they're called mitochondria. They're present in every cell in the body, and they generate most, most of the energy for every cell. So can we have the next slide, please? Okay, no, we can go now. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, it's very simple this this is what happens in the cell so the orange part of the cell which we showed you in the first slide is, is that top orange bar okay that's the cell wall and it's very simplified this but there are two two things that happen you can absorb glucose and you can absorb fat and, and other things obviously lots of other things get absorbed so glucose gets broken down to substance called pyruvic acid Pyruvic acid, and that's the thing on the top right, just above that big oval there. Uh, pyruvic acid is multi, has multiple potential. You can convert it into protein, it can be shunted back into glucose, it can produce lactic acid. Uh, and then pyruvic acid can also be burned by the mitochondria to provide the bulk of your energy. So the advantage of glucose is that you can actually burn, you can produce energy without oxygen. Uh, and that's the only pathway in the body where we can produce energy without oxygen. So it's very, very useful if you're suddenly going to run somewhere very, very quickly. You need to get going very quickly. You break down your hydrogen in your muscle and you'll you, you eventually catch up. Uh, the, on the left, we're talking about fat absorption. Fat gets broken down and it enters into these structures called the mitochondria. And then you can see that both pyruvic acid and the, side of the breakdown products of fat end up with something called acetyl-CoA. So the preferred fuel of the body is actually acetyl-CoA. Because then it goes into that structure just below that with a few arrows, which is called the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, which produces by far the bulk of our energy. So glucose, produces, glucose breakdown to pyruvate is about four net. ATPs, I can't quite remember the exact figure, but the tricarboxylic acid cycle will produce 30 odd um, molecules of ATP, which are about energy molecules in the cell. So glucose is one fuel of the body. Other fuels can be protein as well as fat. Fat actually provides twice as much energy as glucose um, per gram. So it's a very, very useful energy source. So I would argue that you don't need glucose for energy. Apart and what it will make the glucose that it needs. 
Yeah, in fact, if, in fact, if we talk about Dr. Sean Baker, uh, he's, uh, doing, he's doing an experiment at the moment where, and I don't endorse this, um, but I might have a go myself. Uh, he's just eating red meat for, yeah. I think he's been almost a year now with nothing yeah. else whatsoever. And yeah. every one of his indicators, his measurements, his blood, everything is really looking yeah. good. And I'm not saying that's right, that's wrong, but yeah, it just proves that the body can turn fat into energy and one of the ones I love promoting uh, is uh, coconut oil because coconut oil is something called an MCT, a medium chain triglycerate. Uh, because it's a smaller chain, it converts to energy really quickly. So while the years when I was obese, uh, you know, 31% body fat and still running marathons, I would be taking Lucasaid, and there I am in 2008 and 2014. I was, run I was running marathons both those years looking like that. And, uh, but I was drinking loads of Lucasaid and energy drinks. And now I use uh, coconut because coconut turns into energy really, really quickly. Can we go and answer some questions and then we'll get Malcolm on as, as well? Can I, just, can I just say one or two extra, just one sure. thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The glucose need, is, is essential. Um, I think it's because glucose is fairly toxic. The, when insulin's released to try to reduce glucose levels in the blood, there's a, there's a protein co-release called amylin. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the stomach and tries to stop the body absorbing more glucose until it can handle it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that the, the one of the most uh, urgent pathways in the body is the one to clear alcohol. Because alcohol is extremely toxic in the body. Yeah. Yeah. And alcohol is cleared probably with glucose. So if, right. you have your, um, if you have your cocktails, you'll probably clear your alcohol before your glucose. But, but, but no one is suggesting that alcohol is the preferred fuel of the body. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a fuel that can be used by the body, but I wouldn't argue that alcohol is referred to the body is toxic. Yeah. And I think sugar is parked away as quickly as it can be to, to, to get shut of it, really. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I've just got another couple of things. Um, you shouldn't be overeating if you've got type 2 diabetes. You should be fasting, really. You should exercise, you should swap over the ratio of gut to muscle exercise. Mm -hmm. You should exercise your muscles and rest your stomach. Yeah. What we tend to do at the moment is have a sedentary lifestyle and eat all the time. We should do exactly the opposite. I like that. I've never heard that bit of advice so distinctly. That's brilliant. You should be exercising your muscles and relaxing your stomach and not the other way around. Ian, a great question has just come through uh, from a friend of mine actually in India, Sharmil. She's the managing director of our company in India. And Sharmil, her, her husband, uh, is diabetic type 2. And I flew out to India just before lockdown. To, to give him a little bit of training on uh, you know, how to try and reverse his diabetes type 2. But Sean Mills asked the question, uh, why is COVID-19 more dangerous for diabetics? And we know from the research in Italy uh, and Hunan that uh, many people that got diabetes or high blood pressure were more at risk. What's the link? Is that a weakening of the immune system? or? Some people are saying it's a weakening of the immune system, aren't they? And, and I don't understand enough about the immune system to, to, to make a comment on that. Uh, but certainly insulin in high, uh, high volumes in the bloodstream produces a lot of uh, in, uh, inflammatory uh, products called cytokines. Mm -hmm. uh, and these modify the immune system. That may be a, a situation. But the, the other thing is that high glucose levels may impair the ability of the, the tissues to to actually metabolize properly. Uh, a, uh, a, also, sugar uh, competes for the vitamin C for absorption, and Patrick Golden was talking about yeah. uh, the vitamin C. Well, if you're not getting much in your diet, that's probably uh, not a major part of it. I think so, the so body so is just so inflamed that it, it's fine to do so. So it could, be, it could be a combination of things, couldn't it? Also, uh, Sharmil, when, you are, when your body's digesting food, uh, it's not in repair mode. It's kind of almost black and white. You're either in repair mode or digestion mode. So that's why intermittent fasting is great um, because when you're intermittently fasting, you're in repair mode more. That's got to be good for the immune system. Uh, you're right. Well, the, when we've got sugar in the bloodstream, maybe that's limiting the amount of vitamin C we're converting. Uh, it, it's probably, as, as you've said, that in a, a combination of different things there. Um, Chris Patterson, uh, a... Uh, Public Health uh, Collaboration Ambassador says, Steve, thank you for highlighting um, this today. Five years ago, my wife had a heart attack and had to be uh, resuscitated twice uh, due to being an undiagnosed type 2. 
Mm. Wow, that's 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 frightening, Chris. Um, well, let's while well, we're talking about uh, heart disease, uh, we will get on. Let's get on, uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. Malcolm, how are you this morning? Uh, fine, thank you. Fine. Jolly good, jolly good. Uh, for those that don't know Malcolm, he's written many a good book. Um, the, the Great Cholesterol Con uh, explains a little bit about, well, a lot about statins. Uh, my favourite book I haven't got here because I've got it on my Kindle was Doctoring Data about how we learn to read behind all those newspaper uh, headlines. Uh, let's talk, if we can, Malcolm, uh, a little bit about the link between food and heart disease, and then if you've got any advice around heart disease and, and maybe a link with COVID, that'd be great. Well, uh, I was listening in uh, one of the questions of why diabetes may be uh, damaging to people with COVID. Uh, one of the things that seems to be a major problem is what they call a lot of blood clots forming called disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is a kind of later stage thing. And what, what I do know is that uh, people with type 2 diabetes um, are more, they have increased clotting factors, things like, um, what, you know, I'm going to name them by fire, fibrinogen and plasminogen antigen, uh, uh, PAA1, etc. So it's quite likely that diabetes uh, interferes with the uh, clotting system. Um, now, I'm not, I think we're going so so rapidly at the moment with this disease that, that people have come up with a million ideas about everything but that is something that, that I'm I can see as a, as a potential connection um, but then uh, moving on I did, did catch some of the discussion yes what can I say about diet and heart disease well, it's very simple in my world uh, everything the experts tell you uh, is wrong <laughs> don't do it uh, so everything they recommend is wrong and every, everything they say is bad for you is good for you uh, just about entirely, uh, and I think um, this all came about because of the diet heart hypothesis, which was that, namely, that if you eat saturated fat, this raises your cholesterol level, and cholesterol then causes heart disease. So, especially uh, when you're moving into things like diabetes, um, in around about the late 1970s, it was recognised that uh, people with diabetes are more likely to have die of heart disease. Uh, so then they thought, well, eating saturated fat is more likely to cause uh, heart disease. So what we must do is tell all diabetics they must absolutely not fat or saturated fat. Um, so it all comes from this. You can see how it all created a kind of universe of nonsense from the start. So once you've got the, the first piece in position, which is saturated fat or fat, I never get anyone to actually tell you whether it's saturated fat or fat or it's just fat generally it's, it's such a weird thing you can't get anyone to when you just get them. but in general terms people have said i'm all fat, saturated fat is very bad for you once you've set that as the default position all else follows uh which is one of the reasons why i think it's important to change thinking because if you start saying well actually it's, it's not fat it's more likely to be carbohydrates or some sugars or whatever however you define that that's uh, causing the problem you then step back and say well maybe the idea of thinking on fat if you start thinking and thinking on fat is wrong you start thinking the cholesterol hypothesis is wrong then you start thinking we've got everything wrong so to an extent what has happened here is it was created by almost all uh, well, I sometimes call it the geocentric uh, model of heart disease. In that, as you go back to the sort of age later than that, um, it was believed that the Earth was at the centre of the solar system or the universe, and uh, and you can create a model around which planets rotate, and you can kind of create something that makes some sort of a sense. Uh, and then the problem you have with that problem, of course, is completely wrong. But then the moment you start attacking any bit of it, you start the whole thing falls apart in front of your very eyes. Because it's a Galileo noticed that there was moons orbiting around, uh, orbiting around you know, Jupiter. Uh, and then ask the uh, royal astronomers at the court, they can do 
to, to confirm what you could see, they looked at the telescope and said, oh, I can't, I can't see any other things. Because to admit that there were moons orbiting around Jupiter would admit that hypothesis as well was to admit that everything everyone was saying about this structure and I would then aren't completely idiotic and well, same sort of thing is that aren't once you start picking apart one part of the whole Oh, we've just lost Malcolm there. Um We'll try and get Malcolm back. Uh, Ian, uh, thank you for joining us earlier. Have well. uh, we lost Ian and Malcolm? We've lost Ian and Malcolm. We'll try and get Malcolm back. So what Malcolm was, was, was alluding to there, that first of all, when this hypothesis that saturated fat causes heart disease, it happened uh, in America. Uh, they were scrambling to work out why their president had just had a heart attack. And in those two weeks while he wasn't in the Oval Office, uh, a man came along called Ansel Keys, and he basically said the problem is saturated fat. Well, they didn't realise at the time that smoking was the biggest cause of heart disease. So once they started to say saturated fat was the bad, bad guy for heart disease, it was music to the ears, complete music to the ears to the food industry, because saturated fat is quite expensive. And if you haven't got saturated fat, let's load on carbohydrates and sugar, which is cheap to produce. Uh, long shelf lives, make loads of profit out of it. So everybody said, okay, saturated fat is bad, therefore sugars must be good. And the reality was the saturated fat that, that was clogging some people's arteries wasn't being caused by the saturated fat we eat. And that's where the problem goes wrong. And Malcolm will tell you, he says it brilliantly in his book, that the saturated fat in the arteries is caused by one type of sugar called fructose, Fructose is half of the molecules in table sugar, and fructose goes into the liver. Now, it never goes into the bloodstream. That's why you have glucose monitors, but never fructose monitors. Fructose is not allowed into the bloodstream. So if it's not used as energy, it either causes fatty liver disease, or it gets converted into something called a novodilipogenesis, and that takes that fructose and makes it into saturated fat. And it's that saturated fat that can clog the arteries because you can't get saturated fat that you eat into the arteries just because of the way it travels through the body. So saturated fat is the bad guy, but it comes from too much sugar. Isn't that interesting? Read a lot about novo de lipogenesis and you'll get the whole picture. So while we were demonizing fat, Sugar became the prevalent part in all of packaged food and all of canned drinks and soda. And as soon as that started to happen, we've got more and more sick, not less and less sick. But the, the thing that's smuddying the water slightly is heart disease did drop a little bit. However, while heart disease dropped a little bit, we think it's mainly down to us using lead-free petrol. We think it's down to us not smoking so much, but nothing to do with reducing saturated fat. That's why I'm a firm believer, Malcolm's a firm believer, that saturated fat, as long as it's natural fat and not man-made man -made oils, they're actually good for us. Malcolm, we've got you back. How are you, sir? Uh, yeah, thank you. I started disappearing into silence there. <laughs> well, we've got you I back. And, uh, and we can hear you great. I've been boring in my time, but you know, not, not boring, so boring, it just disappears. <laughs> you are the least boring person I've ever, ever met, Malcolm. <laughs> that is for sure. So uh, <laughs> while you were gone there, I was just explaining the fact that uh, let's stop waxing, let's stop worrying about what type of fat it is. It doesn't matter whether it's saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated. The only really thing is, is it real fat or is it fake trans fats? As long as it's real, it's all fine for us. Um, and I was just quickly giving a sort of uh, re recapping what you're saying about where it all went wrong uh, after the, the death of the, uh, well, the heart attack of the president. They were all trying to blame something. Um, and uh, that's where I kind of got to. So uh, carry on with, uh, the, if you can, the cholesterol con and why we think uh, sort of stressing out about your cholesterol levels might be wrong. Well, I think uh, it follows on in a way. I started looking at it and realizing that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. Then, in fact, the entire hypothesis is and must be wrong. Uh, this is more controversial. I think more and more people are recognizing the dietary part may be, may be wrong. But um, 
everyone is still terrified of their cholesterol levels. So uh, and that, that's a more difficult one to to get people to open up their thinking about, I find, because, um, in fact, David Unwin dragged me along to a few of his uh, presentations a few years back. Uh, his job was to say to everyone, it's all right to eat fat um, and you don't need to worry about the cholesterol level. And my job was to follow up and say, yes, because cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. And you could see at that point that some people just going, well, this is just completely kooky now. I mean, we're into we're into mad world time. Um, so, I mean, uh, of course, you can look at it as simply or as, as complicatedly, if you like, uh, uh, as you wish to. Um, I think on the simplest basis, uh, about two years ago, as a group of us in the International Cholesterol, uh, the, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics, called Thinks, who gathered all the information we could together about what they call low-density lipoprotein, which is the... Um, the form of cholesterol in your blood that isn't cholesterol in your blood, but people call it that anyway. Anyway, it's uh, like protein in which cholesterol is carried around. That This is the one that everyone says is desperately dangerous. It's the one that builds up in your artery walls and causes heart disease. Uh, we looked at all the studies that had been uh, over the last, I suppose, 50 years in measuring the, uh, looking at LDL level and the relationship of that with, with heart disease and overall mortality published in BMJ Open, uh, Ophir Ravniskov was the lead author. And what we found was there's no association at all between the LDL level and the risk of cardiovascular disease, that's primarily heart, heart disease and strokes. Uh, in fact, if there was any association, it was that people with higher levels were slightly less likely to get cardiovascular disease. Wow. So, I mean, this is just utterly contradictory research. Uh, and of course, it was attacked, but no one could attack any of the uh, of the data, they said things like well, you only search for English language uh, articles. To which we said, well, yeah. well, that's just because that's like ninety five to ninety nine percent of any major research will be published in English. The chances of there being something out there published in Serbo Croatian or whatever is just I don't wish to insult Serbo Croatian. So, but the reality is that that was just a non argument. I mean, they had no arguments. We're actually putting another and an updated version of this paper together now, and it's going to show exactly the same thing. Because a lot of people jumped up and down and said, right, we're going to prove you wrong. And now they've done lots and lots more research, and they can't find association. Now, I know a lot of people think, oh, cholesterol, if it's in your bloodstream, and then it fills up your arteries. This is just such a nonsense idea. That I can't go into how nonsense it is here. I just don't have time. And, and I'll just start ranting at everybody as usual about this stuff. I know you're back in surgery this afternoon as well, so we would run out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would. <laughs> I'm off to the COVID patients with a paper a paper uh, tissue over my face as provided by the government to protect me. Um, it's Anyway, I'll not get into that, but that's another issue. Um, so, so it's not true. Um, there isn't any evidence. The evidence that there is, is, is absolutely uh, just, well, it doesn't exist. People find this almost impossible to believe as well. Well, surely there must be major, major studies, but, but there aren't major, major studies. I mean, a, a few years back, uh, I was, because I was known for being a cholesterol skeptic, a group of researchers in uh, Norway sent me the research that they'd sent, which is 50,000 patients over 10 years. And what they found was that in men at the level of cholesterol, LDL, made no difference to the risk of cardiovascular disease. But in women, as your cholesterol level went up, up to seven, which most people consider dangerously high, the rate of heart disease just kept coming down. So it's women with the highest level of uh, cholesterol were 40% less likely to die from heart disease as a uh, cardiovascular disease as a woman with a level of five, which is it, considered it's, average. It's frustrating. I mean, I can, I can quote it, well, it, it's like, you know, you say to people, show me the evidence, and they, yeah. they provide these huge papers. And then they say, oh, well, statins lower cholesterol and reduce the risk of heart disease. That's now their argument. And I say, well, I can find you drugs that lower cholesterol by more than statins. And they had no effect on cardiovascular disease whatsoever. And in fact, if you look, um, at, if you look, at, all, if, if, if you look at all mortality, in other words, all death, over, I just saw, saw some research recently, I think it was from over 60 years old, actually the higher your LDL, not the lower, the longer you live, all mortality. 
the opposite to what everybody believes. So as you get older, it may even be protected. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think it's definitely in a case that, that in younger people, it makes seems to make very little difference. And by younger, I mean up to about 55, 60. Everybody study finishes their age at different points, so you can't give a definitive age on this. But say up to 55 or 60, your cholesterol level has very little impact on anything. But as you get older, in fact, the studies in, uh, the, I think the most dramatic one, I saw a study in France where the over 85s, the mortality rate was something like, 70% higher for those who had the lowest uh, LDL levels. Amazing. And um, whether that's a causal thing, I don't think it's a causal thing. I think if you become unwell, your LDL level could fall. Yeah. Um, but equally, it has it has benefits. So yes, I mean, it is like saying, here's the evidence, all the evidence on one side, this is the evidence that uh, that says that LDL is bad for you. And uh, oh, look, there, there really isn't any. And here's the evidence that says LDL is fine or uh, no, no problem at all. And it's an enormous pile. And they just seem to just go, well, I like the, I like the lack of evidence, frankly. Yes. Well, I'm, 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 me. I'm, I'm, it's good I'm, enough for me. I, we've got to turn to questions. So many questions coming in. Uh, read Malcolm's book. They're, they're all the questions for you, so please stay there, Malcolm. But I want to just say, read the Cholesterol Con. It's a great book. Also get Doctoring Data, which to me, almost if it wasn't so such a serious subject, would read like a comedy novel um, because you unpick all the headlines and explain behind those headlines. And if you remember when we met last time, I came up with an acronym called Crimes and said, if you ever read a newspaper headline and the following hap doesn't happen, then forget the headline. Crimes meaning, was that trial? Was it controlled? Was it randomised? Was it interventional? In other words, did they change something? How was it measured? What was the expectancy, life expectancy? If it's not extended, then it doesn't make any difference. And what statistics did they use? There's those five things that need to be done in research and nearly all those newspaper headlines, at least three or four of them are missing. Anyway, the, the, uh, the, the, the book that you wrote there, uh, Doctrine Data, is incredible. Uh, right, let's go and ask some, uh, look for some questions. We've got lots and lots uh, coming in right now. Um, let me find one. Uh, that one was for Ian. Uh, why are Asians more prone to di diabetes, especially if they are vegetarian? Are you comfortable answering that one, as it's more about diabetes and the heart? Well, well I, I think the answer in part is not quite known, but it is fascinating that in fact, um, well, in part the answer is answered by itself, the question is answered itself, which is well, they're vegetarian, aren't they? Um, and that causes them to eat more carbohydrates. Um, I think there's another thing that people don't ever seem to understand is, is that if it's not fat and it's not protein, it's carbohydrate. So vegetables, fruit, all these things, they are, essentially carbohydrates that's so really, that's really what good, you're eating yeah it's a really good point if what you're eating once had a face on it it's predominantly fat and protein if what you're eating never had a face on it it's a plant it's a vegetable uh, it's a grain it is not fat but it is mainly protein and carbohydrates and plus i'll answer that question as well but uh, you know i spend a lot of time in india in particular jaipur and you can't have a meal without the bread, without the norms, without the pop -up. I mean, it's just so carb loaded. Um, um, Neil says, do ACE inhibitors and statins lower one's immune system? There, there's a really, really good point. So if you're on statins or uh, ACE inhibitors right now, do they affect your immune system? And if so, well, what do we do? Well, there's some very interesting research coming out of, um, especially on the COVID stuff about L LDL levels when you get infected, uh, dropping down, and, and people with higher levels being protected. The fact is that LDL is a is a is an important and significant part of your immune system. It binds to bacteria, it binds to viruses, and uh, allows them to then be taken out of the system and dealt with. So what what the, whether it affects other parts of the immune system, that's a different question. But LDL is an essential part of the immune system. And in fact, a very interesting study from uh, from uh, from Holland, 
where they looked at people who had familiar hypercholesterolemia and then traced deaths back in the family to like the 19th, early 19th century. And they knew that these people had had familiar hypercholesterolemia. What they found was that in the in the 19th century, people with familiar hypercholesterolemia were far less, were lived far longer than everybody else. And that was at a time when infectious diseases were essentially wiping out most of the population. This was when we had, you know, TB and we had mm -hmm. syphilis and gonorrheas and sexually transmitted diseases and typhoid and cholera, etc. So it looks like, you know, the, the LDL was protecting people at that time because when you got to the start of the century when antibiotics arrived for quite a while, then FH was associated with an increased risk of death. And now it's come back again. So it's uh, about, about even so. I think the answer on you lower your LDL, you're damaging your immune system. Do ACE inhibitors uh, damage your immune system? Not such as uh, that I am aware. But there is a, an interesting debate at the moment as to where, uh, because the COVID virus enters your cells through ACE receptors in, in your lungs, then if you are taking ACE inhibitors, can this actually mean that you become more uh, more likely to allow the virus into your body. At the moment, there's an, an, an enormous debate going on. Um, I think that probably if you're on ACE inhibitors or ARBs, which are called angiotensin receptor blockers, that you may increase your risk of, of catching COVID. So I, I don't know if that's settled yet, but I think it's a very interesting very interesting area at the moment. No, thank, thanks for answering that. Now, Neil Franks um, must have read your book because he's quoting one of your books, and I love this quote. And in it, you say, uh, so agree with Malkin, that statins don't make you live 15 years longer, they make you feel 15 years older. <laughs> and uh, that, 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 that's yeah. a quote straight from one of your books, which I totally, totally uh, agree with. Malkin says, also, he also says, uh, Malcolm, do statins help secondary prevention in a way truthfully? So in other words, just for people that don't understand that, um, numbers needed to treat. There's some research that she says, and backed up by Bloomingberg, that you need to have 300 people, numbers needed to treat, 300 are taking statins to get one positive outcome. And, and I think what Neil is saying, that one positive outcome, maybe the statins helping in a different way. Um, is that, am I reading that right, I think? Yeah, the, well, the trouble is, again, as, as you know, the book got data because the way that statistics are presented is mind-numbingly and, in many cases, deliberately uh, complex. The number needed to treat is is a weird concept, I think, when it comes to statins, because it's how many people do you need to give this drug to to get one positive outcome? And that, obviously, is dependent on a number of things, one of which is how long you're going to do it for. Mm -hmm. So if you did it for one week, you would see absolutely nothing at all. If you did it for 20 years, you might see quite a reasonable benefit. So that's one aspect of the number needed to treat that's, that's complicated. But essentially, it does look like for some people, men especially, who've, and secondary prevention means have you already had a heart attack or stroke? So mm -hmm. you're trying to prevent the, the next one, the second one. Primary prevention is if you haven't had a heart attack or stroke, you're trying to prevent the primary or first one. So people, for secondary prevention, people are always at higher risk. By definition, they've already got the disease. Uh, and yes, there does seem to be some evidence of a, a reduced re reduction in risk with statins and an NNT. I've seen so many different figures, but essentially uh, I have recommended reluctantly that people who've had a second stroke, especially men who are not getting any adverse effects from statins should probably continue with them. However, if uh, if you're getting adverse effects, it's, it, is it worth it? Um, and the other thing is, I think is important, which I think is touched on by that question is, I do believe that statins have other effects, what they call pleiotropic effects, not target effects, yeah. which are causing the benefit. And, and it's probably uh, what I call a reduction, uh, sorry, an increase in nitric oxide synthesis, which is a very protective molecule for your cardiovascular system and statins increase that quite considerably so um and also i just bring in cunningly very cleverly bringing back in ACE inhibitors because they're blood pressure lowering tablets they have been found to have benefits over and above the amount that they actually lower blood pressure by and they're also quite potent stimulators of nitric oxide so it looks like statins and ACE inhibitors are probably working through the same mechanism 
that mechanism is not actually why they were launched or why they're promoted or has anything to do with <laughs> what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, a bit like when aspirin was found to protect against heart attacks. It was never launched to do that. It was never meant to do that. It was just found to do that. And the way that it does that is it stops blood clots forming. So it reduces blood coagulation. And that's how it prevents heart attacks and strokes. So with drugs, they're often launched saying they're going to do this. And it's found that actually they do something completely different. And that's the thing that's actually causing the benefit. And in fact, you taught me when we uh, filmed the podcast that anything you can do to increase nit nitric oxide, which re you know, sort of relaxes the walls of the endothelium uh, of the arteries, uh, is good. And things such as exercise, sunshine, certain, well, not so much with foods, but some foods, anything that gives you more nitric oxide relaxes the blood vessels and, uh, um, and, and that helps. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. And in fact, one of the things that I'm very uh, strong on, which again puts me at the uh, at loggerheads with the medical profession, is that sunshine is extremely important, uh, not just for producing vitamin D, also synthesizes nitric oxide and has a whole plethora of benefits for us. Um, in fact, a study from Denmark uh, showed, was it Denmark or Sweden? It was one of those countries over there, uh, showed that women who avoided the sun uh, had a reduction in life expectancy similar to women who smoked 20 cigarettes a day so the other way to put that round is if you avoid the sun this is as bad for your health as smoking cigarettes wow. just to give you some idea of the negative impact well i can vouch for that my mother was told by her doctor 30 years ago not to go out in the sun and she hasn't for 30 odd years and and, and she has many problems now uh, from that poor advice. Right, quickly, because we're running out of time. So Chris Patson, who is from the Public Health Collaboration, says, Malcolm, my wife has had a heart attack with cholesterol of 3.5. I am ha happy now. She's at 7.5 in her 60s. So backing up kind of what we're saying there. Uh, uh, Leah says, should a person over 85 come off statins? I don't think Malcolm would want to answer that over the uh, internet because I think doctors get told off by giving advice. Don't know if there's any way we can handle that one without it sounding like advice. Yeah, well, it is a difficult one, um, and, and giving individual personal advice without effectively doing a consultation yeah. is difficult. I would I say. Think what I'd say I, is I, I just, I've also written. A, I've written another. Yeah, sorry. I'd say she goes and gets the book. I've also written <laughs> another book. Yeah, <laughs> I think it will answer your question. <laughs> I, think the, I think the book might just tell you, read, read uh, the, the book. Uh, hi, any diet recommendations for all age groups to improve immunity? Eat real foods, Garima. Cut down on processed foods, cut down on packaged foods, cut down on carbohydrates and eat real foods. Eat foods as dense in nutrition as possible. The more vitamins, the more minerals, the more nutrients in your food, the more you bolster your immune system. The more it turns into sugar, we believe, the more it weakens the immune system. Um, fantastic. Um, um, thank you to so many people that have answered questions. Massive thank you to Dr. Ian Lake, who was with us uh, earlier on. We had a few technical pro uh, problems there, but some real great advice uh, from Dr. Ian Lake. Malcolm, as always, what time are you in surgery today? Uh, one o'clock. Well, we, we better well, I'm <laughs> doing. I'm doing what, what, doing what they call out of hours, which is uh, seeing patients when the CGP surgeries are shut. So it's all it's all got a bit uh, chaotic. But um, I'll be uh, patting people on the head, and they'll be saying, "Have I got COVID?" And I'll be going, "Are you asking me? I have no idea. I can't do a test on anybody." Yeah. But there we are. Well, we salute everybody in the NHS, uh, the care workers, the health workers, yourself, the nurses, the doctors. You're all doing an amazing, amazing job, and let's hope we come out of this uh, stronger the other end. I tell you what, it'd be great fun if you're up for it. Um, can I get uh, doctoring data out, and uh, can we do a whole one on doctoring data sometime in the next week, just for a bit of fun? Yeah, well, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going anywhere. At least I'm not telling anyone I'm going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I would could possibly be going out for a walk up the hills, but uh, uh, that would be terrible. Uh, so yes, that'd be fine we'll, when we get that organised. I'll I'll promote this. Uh, I've been very tardy and not promoted you enough on my uh, on my blog, but I'm getting round to that. Um, Thank you. But I've become apparently someone that, that the news 
people turn to to speak about COVID. I have no idea why that is, but <laughs> so I've been a bit busy recently. Because you've always got, and what I love about you, and I love about all the doctors that worked and helped me, you know, do the book and everything. In fact, Malcolm wrote uh, what, what you call it the forward to my first book. Is that you just speak your mind, and 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 I and I love that. And I know it's dangerous as doctors to say what you believe the truth to be, but you're just fantastic, mate. So keep up the great work, and we'll speak to you soon. Okay, thanks, Steve. Cheers. That was the brilliant uh, Dr. Malcolm. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I was going to almost call you the wrong name then. I was going to call you Malcolm Patrick. <laughs> Kim Kendry, the brilliant, brilliant author, a really good friend. Um, right, so if you can donate, that would be great. We desperately need your support for the food banks. A huge thank you to uh, Ian Lake, Dr. Ian Lake, and to Malcolm. Thank you all for putting uh, your questions up today. That's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, and the last one in the series of how much sugar does something turn into is going to be when you drink a small can of Coke, a regular can of Coke, what is the effect on the blood glucose level, the sugar in your bloodstream? I think we're going to answer that one tomorrow. Uh, in between now and then, keep us safe tomorrow. We'll be back uh, Easter Sunday, same time as ever, 10 o'clock. Please tell all your friends. The more that are watching, the more that are listening, the more we'll get this message out of how to, after keeping our distance and washing our hands, how to best build our immune system. For now, take care. My family and I, God bless everybody. We'll see you all tomorrow.